Our next speaker is Anne Bothello, Director of Marketing at Dubizzle. Now, Anne's been in the real estate industry for over 11 years and within the tech scene for over six. Her focus has been on empowering and influencing teams to bring market new product features and drive forwards creative brands, product and service to launches. In parallel to that, data integration and monetization have been areas of play for her. Now today she's going to be presenting on the subject of AI, the new electricity or not. Ladies and gentlemen, please warmly welcome to the stage Anne Pathello. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So Craig touched brief, bl briefly on the terms doom and gloom. That's what we think when we think about change. Change scares us a little, just a little. But I'm here to inject some inspiration, some hope, and to take a look at real estate as a larger canvas in terms of technology. Now, AI is a big word. People have probably used it in their sentences at least three times today, I'm guessing. But do we really know what it means? I'm going to ask you, how many of you in this room think AI is new? And by new, I mean it's been around for five years. Show of hands. Ten years? Come on, guys, wake up. We need a round of caffeine. How many people have thought that it has been around for 20 years? 20 or more? All right. Let's take a step back then. Let's go all the way back to 600 BC. Yeah, ancient civilizations. What was their thought process? The first men on the planet were trying to figure out how to forge what they call the gods. How can we make our lives a little bit simpler? The first thing started when you took fur and rubbed it against amber and you got static. It's like, whew, what was that? And then you took two rocks and you rub them together and you got a spark. What happened with the spark? Created electricity. What happened with electricity? You had Edison and you had Swan, the first British and American collaboration that was quite a big success, I would say, come up with the light bulb. What did electricity do to our lives? It completely changed our lives. It is not knew. The first AI lab was actually put together in Dartmouth College in the United States, a small group of re researchers that sat around saying, how the hell can we actually create a machine that is as intelligent as the human mind? It was really funny to a lot of people at that time. They thought it wouldn't be possible. Would computational power actually reach that capability? It got funding from the British government, it got funding from the American government. And then, surely, as luck would have it, with any technology, over time, that project did not deliver. So it got divested in. And then you started seeing a dip in expectations of what AI could do. Soon after, the Japanese government decided, oh, you know what, let's revive this. We think that there is a lot of potential with AI. They started funding projects. America started funding the project again. And it went on an upward trajectory until, again, they felt that computers hadn't reached the capability to allow AI to give us what we wanted. And Gartner came out with this curve. Does anyone know this curve? It's called the curve of disillusionment. Has anyone seen this before? What this says is pretty basic. If you think of any technology, you start with early adopters who are very keen and they think it's awesome, and it gets funding, and then it gets a lot of press hype. Yeah? What does the press hype do to teams that are building technologies? It stresses them out. It stresses them out to deliver, 
And when they can't deliver, investors go back and say, hey, what's going on here? It starts getting negative press. It goes down. The expectations go down. And then you get to a point of disillusionment. Is this even worth it? Until investors start seeing it from afar and they think, let's put a little bit more money into this. And then you get to slope of enlightenment and un ultimately we get to some level of productivity where we build the product or technology further. And then what happens? We get disrupted all over again. And this curve, dear, is a curve that is replicated with every single technology. Three years ago, these hundred startups did not exist. All these startups are in the field of AI, from robotics to fintech to the automotive industry to banking, you name it. What does that mean? That means that we are in a phase where people are seeing appetite for artificial intelligence. Ray Kurzweil is actually the chief engineering officer at Google. He is a futurist and someone I highly admire. And he said this, which I strongly believe. He said, artificial intelligence will reach human levels by around 2029. Follow that out further to say 2045, we will have multiplied the intelligence, the human biological machine intelligence of our civilization billion fold. We need to hire people who are imaginative. We need to hire people who are curious about the world and the future and who have an obsession with technology. Because if you don't have those people in your organizations, you will fail. There is no doubt about it. Someone will come and disrupt you. So you had computer science specialists that started building algorithms. You started developing artificial intelligence, which then started building into machine learning models, which finally moved into deep learning. All these great buzzwords. Let's break it down, and I'll do that for you a little bit later. Anyone in this room know who this guy is? If you've come to any of my talks, you've probably seen this slide, but I can't help but share it until everyone in the room says they know who this guy is. This guy is Gordon Moore. Gordon Moore is exactly the person and the reason, actually, his thoughts were the reason why you have a smartphone in your pocket. He said that every two years, the number of transistors on an integrated circuit would double. What does that mean? This graph is one of the most important graphs of our century. It is the most important graph for anyone who wants to learn about technology. What does it say? It says in the last 500 years, we have only been growing on a linear slope. In the last 50 years, from the microprocessor all the way to the self-driving car, we have actually developed everything in 50 years. Why so? Because our computational speed has grown exponentially. So this is really the story of our lives. You know, where this guy over here, life is so predictable, we have no idea what's going on. Suddenly, some technology comes and disrupts our industry, and we're thinking, oh my god, I missed the boat. What happened over here? But those of you who are thinking about disruption of the future are going to be on that upward trajectory. So in simple terms, 30 linear steps, if each step was a meter, is 30 meters ahead. 30 exponential steps, is 26 times around the globe. Think about that. I'm going to give you a quick example. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but we can talk about it after the talk. Kodak was in the business of helping people store their memories. They had cameras. They made their business off actual printing photos, photo reels. They actually had the inventor of the digital camera. But they thought, you know what, we're going to save our core business, and we're not going to take it to market. We'll wait it off a little bit. What happened? 2012, Kodak went bankrupt. Kodak went bankrupt. They were actually a $28 billion company. How much do you think Instagram's worth? 
Who, who uses Instagram in the room? How much do you think it's worth? Citigroup valuation gave it a value of $35 billion. It's currently worth $100 billion. Imagine that. That's digitizing photos for you. Kodak didn't see that coming, did they? So we are living in the most extraordinary time right now in human history, and our potential is massive. We need to step outside that box. I don't even believe there's a box. You need to think a lot bigger than you're thinking today. We are in the fourth industrial revolution. Let's see what that means. Can we have the sound, please? So what this touches on is we move from steam, from the steam industry. It's not working, dear. We moved from the steam industry, moved into the electric phase when electricity was discovered and everything changed for us. Then we went into the autonomous phase where factories were completely disrupted. And now we're in a phase that is brand new. We are connecting physical assets to biological assets and we are digitizing them. Who has a Fitbit? Who counts the number of steps they walk every day to figure out you know, what's the right amount of steps for your health? These are devices we wear, wearable devices. We're in a completely new industry. If we were to look at this, this sums it up. We've moved from water to steam, to electricity, to automation, to cyber-physical systems. We are already in that phase. It's crazy, because a lot of us sitting here don't know how much it's going to impact our lives. But what is AI? Andrew Ning, who is a professor at Stanford, as most brilliant people become professors of Ivy League schools, he was ex-VP of science at Baidu, and now currently at Google, where he co-founded Google Brain. He put it quite simply. AI runs on data. The more data you have, you feed it in to a system. It takes something, you give it an input, and it gives you an output. So you have a face. All our faces in a system, it will tell you which face is you. Facebook already does this. It's face recognition, right? Even your phone, the iPhone X, can do it for you. You take loan applications. It tells you if it's going to lend you a loan for your home. Ad servers like Google AdWords Take an, takes an ad that I upload onto a system, which is Google AdWords, and it tells you the bids. It tells you who's going to see them. This is all running on AI tools, AI technology. Speech recognition, when you speak to Siri. What is Siri doing? It's co collecting all our different accents and all our different talks and speech tones to be able to, in the future, have conversations with you. Self-driving cars, you feed it information from sa the satellite and it can pinpoint where things are when a self-driving car is on the road. So really, to break it down, deep learning takes information that it's fed data, and it starts detecting, in, this, in terms of pictures, edges and blobs of the picture. Then it finds textures of the picture, so it can tell you, is this a tree or is this a green tablecloth? It then looks at objects and parts. Whoops, that would have been fatal. Um, <laughs> and then structures it into object classes. So when you're actually on a road as an as automated car, if I was an automated car, I'd probably be able to see things this way. What are the objects? What are people, right? It can detect, it can tell for itself. More intelligent systems. Now, in the field of real estate, what's changing? So if we look at property advisors, community management, and concierge services, there is so much that's changing in this scope. Let's take a look at this video. Now, this was one of Google's, well, I would say, one of their many 
accomplishments this year. What they did is they created Google Duplex. How many people in this room has a, ha a personal assistant right now? You have a wife or a husband who you ask them to do stuff for you? <laughs> All right. Listen to this. You're actually going to be able to spend more time doing meaningful things because this is a Google personal assistant that is calling a salon to make an appointment. See what that sounds like. Can we? And this is where technology fails us. <laughs> Okay, my talk's done. All right, so, so just for the matter of time, I can't even move this, so. Okay. So just to give you some context on what the video was. So Google in May 2018 actually created a Google personal assistant. They have been training their algorithm through machine learning and deep learning to be able to take in dialogue from you and me and actually intelligently decide how to respond to a situation. This is not an A and B output in the sense of, all right, if I say hello to Siri, it's going to say hi back. This is questions, as in, I want to book an appointment between 8 and 9 o'clock. Do you have an availability? And then, the, and then the human being comes back and says, no, sorry, I think we need to move it up to 12. And then the machine actually comes back and has a conversation to schedule the perfect fit without any detection of a robotic tone of voice. Now, that's quite crazy. I would love to have a deck to share that with you. <laughs> In Dubizzle? No, not yet. But we, I could take this offline, but there is algorithms that we use to help people find the things they want quicker. You're Sorry? You're on it? So we're going to buy you out soon? <laughs> I look forward, I'll have that conversation with you. Well, maybe Sofitel on the Palm needs an upgrade. <laughs> but you know, that's a very valid point, right? So technology, for the most part, will have its flaws. And over time, it will only get better. But that's where human intellect comes in as well. We will need to still be there. May I suggest that whilst we are waiting for AI to update, <laughs> that... Yeah, I don't think the sound is working on this. Maybe we can take one question for you, Let's Anne. do it. If there is a question, let's know your name, your company, and your one question. Then again, it would appear that they all want to hear Siri make a hair appointment. Any questions? Yeah. If we can have your name, your it's company, and your question. It's not working. It's not. 
Uh, my name is Fatih from Fan so, Properties. Uh, so the question I is... I think there was... Okay. Uh, Go ahead. Do you think that the role of the real estate agent in Dubai will be eliminated in the future in Dubai? Look... Due to these technologies? I'll be honest. Over time, when you're thinking about the future, you need to be open to the idea that technology is going to help us make better decisions. What that means is that the real estate industry is going to have to stay ahead of the game. Will human beings need interaction with other human beings to validate their decisions? Yes. So I may use a tool right now in the next five years to help me make a better decision, but I would go to an expert who's had human touch or interaction with other owners, with other brokers, with other developers to get a second opinion. And over time, to answer your question, yes, there is potential, and we need to be very open to that mindset that our industries are going to be disrupted, because they are. Craig briefly touched on driverless cars, how malls are going to change, the future of malls. I'm going to touch on that in a bit. I think I'll go on with my presentation, even though the volume's not uh, working. But to answer your question, mall structures and cities the way the infrastructure is set up is going to evolve quite dramatically. It's not going to look the same as it does 20 years down the line. So we're going to get better. Unfortunately, we couldn't listen to that, but we're going to get better at complex conversations over time, meaning your phone will be able to have a conversation with you and make appointments for you and be your personal assistant. Guess what? You will have more time with your wife and your kids, and you won't be sitting around making these calls for yourself. It's all going to be automated. It's going to be in your pocket. Amazon's Alexa is a fast learner. In four quarters, it learned 10,000 skills. I mean, just think about that. Human potential isn't that big. So we are making machines that are very intelligent, and we're going to have to be aware of that. So I think we're having a problem with sound, so unfortunately, a lot of my talk is about videos, but I'm going to have to talk you through it now. So to give you some context around augmented intelligence. So the service industry, and I'm going to play the video so it's playing in the background, but I'm going to talk you through it. The service industry is going to be disrupted. How is it going to be disrupted? And it's already Hi, happening. Can I help you? Hi, I'm calling to book a women's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something that, on May that's 3rd. That's actually the last video. Sure, give me one. That's so we are having technical difficulties here. <laughs> All right, so just to give you context around this, this is Microsoft HoloLens. What the HoloLens will enable people to do is electricians or, you know, property specialist that need to fix a lift or an elevator or is on a construction site and needs a quick answer will be able to wear a device that can then hook up to tons of information, not only about the building, so historical data, but it will be able to give advice to the technician on site based on other people who've actually completed this task before. What does that mean? That means efficiency within the property management services industry is massive, the things that could happen. But then, you know, there's the funny question of, will humans be replaced by robots? And until that happens, we'll still need this, this gentleman here. We'll still have a job. <laughs> um, but yes, I mean, it's, it's true that it's going to be in phases when it comes to technological disruption. We're going to get better at complex problem solving with time. So not just conversation. So AI systems are going to run better with time as it learns how to have conversations. I was just in San Francisco, and I met this guy at my door. 3 AM in the morning, I wanted a bottle of water. There was no human that came to me. This little machine delivered that bottle of water, and it was very adorable. It actually had a conversation with me and left. What does that mean? That we're going to have to figure out how to reskill waiters, bellboys. What are they going to be doing? We are going through a disruptive phase. There will be change. And a lot of people smile about it and laugh about it and think, is this really going to happen? The question is, are we going to wait for it to happen or do something about it and get on that bandwagon? 
There's disruptive ripple effects from elsewhere as well, and this is really important. Again, there, the videos can't play, but I'll tell you what this is. So we all know how the automotive industry is changing quite dramatically. How many people think that the automotive industry is going to impact real estate? Yeah, it is. This is actually a video of a self-driving car. A family was in it. There was an accident that took place, and the, driving, the, the car stopped for itself. Yeah. What I wanted to show you, and unfortunately you can't hear it, but what I wanted to show you is that the car actually makes a beep before it stops. And this beep was so accurate, the human eye could not detect when an accident could take place, but this machine could. So I'm going to replay that, and it's going to stop at the point where the car actually detected. It actually detected that there was an accident. Right there. That's when the beep happened. It went beep, and then five seconds later, the accident emerged. What does this mean? This means we're already in a stage where AI and automo autonomous cars, self-driving cars, have the capability to be pretty safe. What does that do to our cities? This guy is one of the VPs of product at Volvo. Okay? He's one of the brainchilds behind the new Volvo driverless car. He talks about how electric cars in these cities, and they're already doing a lot of test runs, are going to change infrastructure in cities. It's Insane. If you think about the UAE right now, if you think about Dubai, we think, ah, oh, is that really going to happen in the next five years? I just want to make my money and get out, right? Yeah, but you're going to go back home. What's going to happen in the next 10 years, 15 years? You know, when we were riding horses, we didn't think cars would come, in, come into play in full effect. Similarly now. Driverless cars are going to be the next thing, and it's going to change the landscape of cities. So think about parking lots. What's going to happen to parking lots? How are malls going to change? Will it need massive parking lots? There's 5,000 new parking spots being added in Dubai Mall. Is that going to be the case in 10 years? Are we going to have to repurpose that space? Think about landscaping. With cities being so well organized, driverless cars, no pollution. How do we create greener cities? These trees are called super trees. They're in Singapore. Um, and what they are is vertical gardens that live within the city that allow for cleaner, more sustainable breathing air within the city. Why, why, is, why are people trying to use technology to create more greener spaces? Because our world's going to need it. These trees are meters high. They actually have solar panels embedded in the sides of them that supply energy to plants to grow at the optimal pace without overconsumption. Think about energy. All of this is going to affect real estate. Just last week, on the 25th of October, a couple in the United States got awarded $1.5 million dollars. For what? They have figured out, and this is pretty funny if you think about it, they have figured out how to absorb atmosphere from the air and create water. Imagine if these kind of systems are plugged on the top of the buildings, what will happen to power plants? What will happen to piping? What will happen to our systems? They will all change. Are we staying up to date about technologies like this? and it is fully functioning. They are now planting it in communities to see how it can move the entire community to run on water by sucking in moisture from the air. Are we thinking big enough? If a city's way of functioning changes, how will real estate, the real estate industry change? It's going to be disrupted, and we need to be aware of that for the better. But we need to be aware of it so we can take the right steps to actually benefit from it, not to be scared by it. 
So disruptive changes can come both from within, and that's everything from advisory tools and smarter homes and what have you, and externally from the vehicle industry, fintech, new energy, infrastructure. We all know that Dubai is on that path to become a more sustainable smart city. So how can we actually play in this space, whether you are part of a government organization or the private sector? So what does AI really do for us? It helps us get boring, repetitive stuff done, right? It helps validate our decisions. And it helps problem solve and create new versions, better and faster versions of ourselves which gives us more time to think about what we do for the world. What about governance? Governance is going to be a big thing. If we have more intelligent tools, who's going to be running our countries? Who's going to be running our companies? So there needs to be a change in economic models, a shift in consciousness. It's no longer going to be about growth or how can we make more incremental gains in revenue. It's going to be more about how to maximize human, human well-being. The thought process is changing. And you know what's really funny is that everyone in this room looks at their time in a professional industry and thinks, I'm an expert. I've got this. I'm ahead of the game. I can win the market. Do you know what's happening? You are being disruptive by, disrupted by 18-year-olds who are not even college grads yet, who are sitting in their rooms trying to figure out better solutions. Why? Because they are thinking out of the box. This company called New Story looked at 3D printing and looked at the world and said, hey, not everyone has a roof over the, our, their head. What can we do? And how can we make money off it? doesn't mean that you become a a charity organization, you find, bill, you find business models that work for you. This is a team of people who are less than 30 years old, all of them. They got investors, about six investors, who are experts in various fields, from 3D printing to technology to social responsibility. And now they're building homes in developing countries and making good money out of it. Yeah, pretty cool. A 3D printed home for $4,000 built in 24 hours, not a, bad, um, not a bad deal. I would say the construction sector needs to start thinking about that. So questions and reflections that I want to leave you with. Will the internet reinforce global sharing of resources and human rights? Or will, it, will misinformation divide us all? Will these intelligence tools start dividing countries into more nationalist countries, or will it create globalization? With technology empowering new forms of government, there's different governments that could emerge from an artificially intelligent-led infrastructure. There's aut autocracies, which will be based on surveillance and control by algorithms. There'll be monarchies, which will have control over social media. There'll be theocracies, there, which is different AI as new gods. They will be giving advice for everything we do, the future. Will it be republics, people who can talk about the inspiration of technology being government leaders? Communism will be, be looking at a universal basic income for everyone. Or will it be dem democracies, which is shared, distributed ledgers, everything that blockchain and AI will enable us to do in the future? That's something to think about. As we become a more connected and self-aware society, one that's fully automated, the questions we ask will change. How will we keep up and adapt with exponentially charged world and organizations? What will we do with our time to create better communities? These are the questions we need to ask ourselves. And I leave you with five critical takeaways. The first one, the rate of accelerating change is increasing. Standing still is, inev is an inevitable death. There are several companies that are get getting wiped out by technologies that are coming in to disrupt 
Jobs will be lost to technology. There's 50 million jobs that are expected, expected to be lost by 2021 due to automation. Competition is no longer how we once viewed it. It will be the college kid that will disrupt your business. Think of home beyond the borders of your own countries. Think about that. Think of home beyond the borders of your own countries. That's where the scale of impact lies. Think about it. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got time for one quick question. If you have any, then please do raise your hand. Let us know your name taken, name, company, and question. Hi, my name is Najdi from MHM Real Estate. I just want to ask you, you just mentioned that there will be almost 50 million uh, jobs will be lost. How many new opportunities and jobs will be created based on the new technologies? That's a very good question and one that many organizations and leaders are thinking about. Look, during any revolution, there's a phase of uncertainty. What does that mean? People who will be displaced will need to reskill themselves. We will, as leaders, need to figure out how to reskill these employees and these, this staff. Take a look at the Walmart model. They're actually doing this. They invest heavily in disruptive technologies. It's, it's what, the food industry? It's, it's the retail business? And you think, really, they invest in disruptive technologies? Think in what, uh, have a read of their case study. What they're doing is they're trying to gamify the actual keeping or harnessing their staff within their own companies through educating them and then building them up into the space of technology. So not necessarily slashing off jobs. They need to cut off. They definitely needed to cut off a significant amount of them. But then what they did is the ones that showed some significant interest in technology and product, they reinvested in them because they know that that needs to happen. There will be a wave of change, and people who are not seeing that change are going to be hit like a storm. And that's why education currently, if you go to Coursera.com or you go to Udemy, Udemy is a tool where you can find courses that you could do for data science, or you could find courses that you can read up and learn more about blockchain. A six weeks course for peanuts. So unless people are encouraging their teams, to educate themselves, we will be facing a wave of uncertainty. Ladies and gentlemen, Anne Bethello. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.